Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, last, uh, last talk before a panel discussion, so last kind of slide by slide you have to listen to for a little bit. Um, two things. One, so Klaus in, uh, invited me to come speak here, and I said, but, but it's a large, large language model thing. Like, we literally do not do large language models. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about why, why not, um, and, and kind of our approach to it. Um, the second thing I want to mention is I actually i am going to show you some slides that are from our pitch deck. And I am not here to pitch our startup. However, we are working now in this field who are suddenly, I mean, we've been working on this startup since 2015. We've been doing a lot of research, a lot of development, uh, and suddenly we are in this crazy field where everyone has an opinion and everyone, you know, uh, wants to say. And so I wanted to show you a little bit kind of how we pitch the startup and how we position ourselves as well, especially if there's anyone in the audience that are more startup oriented, I thought that might be, might be interesting. So, but it's not my purpose to be here and pitch all the cool things that we do. Um, but what we do, which is really cool, uh, <laughs> now that we're working uh, towards, we've, since 2015, we set out to build what we call an AI researcher or an AI system that can make sense of the entire scientific world for us um, and help us draw conclusions because we publish 6,000 research papers every single day and we can't make heads and tails of it. And that's, in short, what we've been working on ever since, and this was long before ChatGPT or any one of the other um, systems. So one of the kind of core things that we have to solve for is facts, right? And as we've heard in every other talk today, well, that is a problem with the large language models, which is also one of our reasons for not utilizing that part of all of the exciting AI stuff that's going on. So I want to talk a little bit about when factuality matters. And fact is, <laughs> no pun intended, um, that the, the large language models right now is failing in adherence to facts. And for us, that is especially true for the field we're working in, with it, which is science. And I'm sure some of you saw Meta's Galactica model that were released and was live and available for a full three days before they pulled it back, um, where the model you know, would make beautiful, beautifully generated scientific articles with sources and everything on uh, you know, very interesting topics such as, uh, tell us about that time we sent bears to space. Right? And it made a beautiful article with references everything about how some Russians sent some bears to space. And, you know, it's, that's, as a scientist, as a researcher, that is so far from what you need. And the model was live for three days. And some of the things that are not solved by the large language models, and it has been touched on by several of the other speakers as well, is, you know, working with, with small data sets, right? Um, working with unique terminology, out of vocabulary words, um, working with in-depth nuances. There is no room for hallucination when you deal with scientific knowledge and precision is vital, right? And these are the challenges, and every one of these is a fundamental problem for the large language models of today, right? And I'm talking about 2023 and where we're at right now. I'm not talking five years into the future necessarily. So these are some of the things that, that we're solving for. Um, and kind of three kind of key components of what we're working with. And just to let you know, uh, my, my CTO is, uh, is, is here as well, and he'll be giving a talk later, so he'll be going into a little bit more technical detail. Uh, so I won't cover that. But basically, our principle is that we work with, and we call them a little cheeky, we call them smart language models, not large language models. Um, but basically, um, models that are computationally efficient, right? Reducing carbon footprint. That wasn't our primary uh, purpose with it. Our primary purpose was to make models that actually would make affordable tools. So that we sell them to research departments, it actually comes at a price point that makes sense, that solves a challenge um, that is, is worth paying for. Um, we also do some machine vision and, 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 and of course, a lot of clever engineering. Uh, another thing that's really important to us is leverage knowledge, right? So data set curated by a human or in some instances made by our machines, but a curated data set and how can we inject that knowledge into the system? Uh, and then finally, kind of precision and recall being vital. And so we can measure the coherence and the factuality. And we've done this for scientific research, which is the field that needs this the very most. However, we do believe, and that's kind of also interesting, that you know, seven years ago, if you'd asked Victor, uh, our CTO, like, do you think that what we're building here can, can make a difference in the kind of world moving towards artificial general intelligence, he would have said yes, and everyone would have thought we were a little crazy. But now, seven years later, actually making AI systems sticking to scientific facts and, you know, um, 
managing them and, and tracking them, well, that is going to be key, right, as we move forward into this future. Um, a little bit about some of, some of our beliefs, as I said, the right price performance, right? And, and that is not the case for a lot of large language models. Um, we did a, it was very, very back of the napkin calculation, but I think it was the OPT-175 model or something like that, where we sort of made an estimate that a, a generated summary would cost about $180. Um, we also have a summary generation, um, an abstractive summarization engine, and our summaries cost about 23 cents, right? And that's kind of the difference we're looking at. Now, our summaries are not that good. They don't hallucinate as much either, um, but, um, but the kind of the, the core difference is massive. Um, as I said, there are some kind of fundamental challenges in scientific applications that are not solvable by large language models. We also believe, and it's interesting, you know, the, the kind of revealing details about the human in the loop with a lot of the large language models, we also believe that you shouldn't need human-made taxonomies and human, you know, human training uh, in order to build systems that are actually usable um, and scalable. And that's kind of been our, our starting point for it. Um, and we also believe in horizontal scalability. Uh, but these are just, um, I'll be mindful of time, just some of our principles. Um, we do have, I mean, we're not just building language models and technology. We also have uh, tools and platforms, and we have a, I mean, someone said earlier, uh, we, you know, you, you don't build your own search engine. Well, we, we, we did, because we're dealing with scientific research. Um, so we had to do that. But we also have a range of other tools. Um, we do have a tool for extracting and systematizing data from research papers, which is globally unique. Uh, so you can actually ge you know, generate data sets from, let's say, I mean, one of our clients is generating a data set of material science recipes and content and properties from 50,000 research papers and generating a database of that. So those kinds of tasks are, are what, we're, um, what we're working on. And long term, as I said, building an AI researcher, it's not that far fetched from or far away from what we're seeing with these LLMs today. You know, a system that you can ask anything and get a response. The only thing that we're trying to achieve that is different is that it should be factually correct, right? And draw conclusions and inference on top of that. And that is not an overnight undertaking, to say at least, right? But we're starting from the other end. Computationally efficient um, uh, algorithms that are stay sticking to the facts. Um, and that's the, the, so we kind of, we take the exact opposite starting points as, as all the LLMs. Um, one framework that I think is really interesting that hopefully will be useful as well is when we're dealing with this field of, of natural language processing, let's call it at large, you know, there's going to be kind of a quadrant here where can you measure the correctness or, of the answer or not? And is precision important or not, right? Is it, is it sufficient that the answer appears plausible, right? And so we have this kind of mass market opportunity for the LLMs where you cannot necessarily measure the correctness of the, um, of the answer and the fact that the answer appears plausible is sufficient. And that is where we're at with the LLMs right now, right? Now, there's plenty of really cool use cases in that, right? Marketing creation, creating slogans, creating um, school essays. I know that's, uh, <laughs> that's a whole, whole debate in its own, right? Marketing materials, search engine, simple summarization, where it's not, you, you cannot fully measure the correctness, and it appears plausible, and that's enough, right? And that's, there's a lot um, of things, and I, I think it was interesting with a with a talk earlier about the interviews, right? That also falls into this. It's not necessarily an answer is right or wrong, and it needs to be plausible so that you can have that conversation and practice the dialogue. It's a perfect example, right, of 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 a really good use case where you can get a lot of value. But then you have the cases where you can measure the correctness of the answer, and precision is really important, and that's a field where where the LLMs right now just aren't going to be applicable, and that's where we see a lot of kind of, let's call it specialist or niche, uh, specialist or niche applications um, that really, you know, startups like us can actually excel. Um, I mean, to, to be a little bit more concrete, we've built all of this out into what we call the researcher workspace, um, which is a, a tool suite for researchers. But I won't, I won't bore you with a, <laughs> with a pitch of the tool, but there are concrete tools at the end of all this, this research and our approaches. Um, which means that we can actually go into a market and actually make money on this, um, right? And, and there is a clear business model, which is kind of the, the final thing I want to touch on, which is 
also a challenge in this field, right? There is no clear business model around these large language models, right? Um, of course, you know, Microsoft is doing their thing and kind of trying to revive Bing. Is that a mean thing to say? Um, but, but, you know, there are, there are business models around it, but for startups, for people building tools, there is, there, there is no clarity. Um, and yes, I'll, I'll wrap up in a second. There's no big clarity in who's going to make money and how, and if you rely on, uh, on you, know, some, you know, technology that someone else built, what's the pricing model going to be in the future, etc. So... With that, that was very short. Uh, hopefully that gave you some insight into a different way of thinking. There will be a technical, uh, technical little bit more deeper dive um, after the break. And so with that, thank you very much.